Chapter 4 Bethany stared at the shower. She did not want to go in. Her aversion to water had become worse after her stint in the pool. She avoided the shower for three days by using dry shampoo, copious amounts of wetted wipes, and washcloths. She had worn hats, for pity's sake, to cover the telltale signs of her hair. It was past time to go in. A quick shower, just turn it on to pre-wet, turn it off, lather, on to rinse, turn off, condition, on to rinse again, off and get out. Bethany had done it plenty of times, and it was better than trying to put her head under a sink. She shuddered at the thought of contouring herself under sink faucet. It was too close of a position to the memory that haunted her. Bethany was afraid she might drown herself, which was just silly. People could not drown themselves without purposely using certain measures. A human survival instinct was too strong. Bethany looked at herself in the mirror. She liked to be clean, to look perfect. Her father and her mother had instilled in her from a very young age that she should always look her best. School had reinforced that edict. She did not look grungy, but she felt it. She wished she could take some of the leftover pills that her previous psychiatrist had prescribed her. Bethany wanted to numb her fear right now. She also wanted to remember. The two needs warred with each other, and Bethany sighed, giving up. She left the bathroom and compromised by crawling into bed. She would shower tomorrow morning. Procrastinating was not going to help her, Bethany thought drowsily. Sleep claimed her. Where was it? Her childish feet slapped against the weathered boards as she ran in the hot sunshine. She knew she was not supposed to be out here without the boys, but they were doing something boring, so she had slipped away. It was not like she was going to try to steal the boat. She just wanted to find it and pretend she was a pirate, or a princess on a boat tour, or shipwrecked. Was this the boat, or the next one? She could not remember. Bethany searched the marina. There were so many boats. She did a little skip, a pirouette, then bounced forward. She was going to be an amazing ballet dancer. Maybe she would pretend to be a ballerina on vacation. Ballerinas could afford yachts, couldn't they? She jumped onto a boat, confident in her ability to judge the distance over the water from the dock to the deck. She began to explore even as she realized her mistake. It was the wrong boat. It was far too big, yet that did not stop her from looking. She stopped in the yucky, yellow-colored bathroom. The boys called it a head. She didn't know why. She was also stumped because this one had a bathtub. Sure, it was tiny, but it was there, and no boat that she knew of ever had a bathtub. Of course, she only knew of one other boat. Bethany shrugged. She was about to leave when she heard voices. Voices that she knew. She was not supposed to be here. Bethany crouched down, hiding beside the toilet. If they found her, she would get in a lot of trouble. She tried to shrink her little body down to nothing so they would not see her. The door opened. Bethany jerked awake in bed, her heart hammering. She grabbed her journal, furiously writing down the details of the dream so that she would not forget anything. Once the words were down, she read them over, adding or crossing out as her mind remembered the dream. Who did she know that had a boat? Bethany put the pen and book down, lying in her bed and staring at the ceiling. She searched her mind and came up empty. Tossing off the blankets, Bethany grabbed clothes and headed to the shower. This was going to happen. Bethany took a deep breath and turned on the spray. Maybe while she was under it, she might get another flashback, she told herself sternly. Bethany forced herself to take the shower, hating every moment of it. Afterwards, she felt much better for being clean, but disappointed that no memories had surfaced. She knew it was not wise to force things. Dr. Ershman kept telling her that. However, Bethany wanted to know the truth about what had happened so long ago. Why had she constantly been made to go to a psychiatrist, to be medicated? Her mother had talked about her having constant nightmares as a child, that Bethany had become difficult and unruly. Her father said it would have been necessary. She just did not understand. It was near dawn and the sun was starting to slowly light up the world. Bethany grabbed her coat and keys. She called a cab and waited impatiently in the lobby for it to arrive. Where to, lady? The taxi driver asked her. The nearest marina, answered Bethany. 
She waited while he punched information into his phone, looking for an address. Soon enough, the cab was moving. Looking to rent a boat? Pretty early in the morning for that, the cabbie remarked. Bethany looked out the window. If you could wait for me once we get there, I would appreciate it. Sure thing, he agreed, concentrating on his driving when it became clear that she was not in a talkative mood. It did not take long to get the marina. Bethany exited the taxi, looking over the boats. She would not know one boat from another. The point was not to find the one in her memories. Bethany had no expectation of that. No, it was to try to trigger the rest of the memory. When she was a child, she had obviously been found. Yet, what had the man in her dreams thought she had seen? Why did he want her to be quiet? Who was he? She wandered down the walkway toward the boats and water. Bethany tried not to think of the water she chose a path to take. Hiking her purse higher on her shoulder, she wondered if anyone would be about. Could she hop on one of the boats? Did she need permission if no one was around? Bethany did not see a single person. Somehow, her feet had taken her down one of the long wooden walkways. She felt sick at the sight of the water around her. For a moment, she considered backing away, going back to the cab. That would not get her any answers. Trembling, Bethany walked to the edge of the dock. She cleared her throat nervously and clutched her purse strap in a death grip. Hello? Drew knew money when he saw it. He also knew he must have done something that made the man upstairs unimpressed to have two totally clueless people crash his police assignments within the same week. While she was absolutely gorgeous, she was also unwelcome. Seriously, was this the new trend? He could not believe it. Shouldn't someone be guarding these people? Drew groaned. She was approaching the boat that he was hiding in. Could it get any worse? His supervisor was going to have his head. He switched on his radio. Who was responsible to make sure civilians did not wander into our stakeout? Monroe was on that detail. Did you see her? She is a looker. Colby whistled through the radio, like an actress. Hello? Is anyone there? A trembling feminine voice asked. Why me? Drew muttered and looked up. He did not go to church often enough. Jana would say that this was God's way of nudging him, telling Drew that something was not quite right in his life. Monroe was going to pay for the mistake. Drew was unfortunately going to have to do damage control. He stood up, coming out on the deck, smiling in a disarming manner at probably one of the most gorgeous women he had ever seen off a television set. She was tall willowy, impeccably dressed with blonde hair and uncertain blue eyes. Can I help you? She stared at him in surprise. You look just like Max. Drew dropped the smile. He was getting sick of Max Ramsley and he barely knew the guy. Yes, he looked a lot like his brother. Correction, half-brother. Drew was not certain that was a compliment, her comparing him to Max. Lady, is there a reason you are here? Bethany did not know why he had gone from charming to disgruntled. For some reason, he did not like getting compared to Max. Then again, Max was not attractive in her opinion, and this guy definitely was. Her nervous heart had taken a little leap while it took her brain a moment to catch up to what she had been seeing. He was the cliché of tall, dark, and handsome, but with the tattoos on his arms and the scar splitting his eyebrow, he was dangerous-looking, too. Bethany shoved away the thought. I would like to come on your boat. It was not his boat. Drew had commandeered it as a good vantage point. He could tell her to get lost, go back to wherever upscale place she came from, or he could let her on the boat so that he knew exactly where she was at all times. Letting her go risked her running into the very criminals they were trying to trap. Drew sighed. Monroe owed him for this. Welcome aboard. She hesitated. In fact, it seemed like she was stalled, hanging on to her purse strap like she feared he might steal it from her. Lady, are you coming or not? Drew did not have time for her to waste. She was sticking out like a sore thumb, and he did not need for her to mess up the operation. Are you going to ask me why? she asked nervously, clutching her purse. I have not even introduced myself. Ma'am, I don't much care. Drew held out a hand to help her onto the deck at the boat. He flashed her his badge with the other hand. Please, get on the boat. What is going on? Bethany looked at him with some alarm. 
For a brief moment, he wondered if she was in on the criminal side, that they used her to check out the area before committing to a drop. Immediately, Drew dismissed the idea. She was too high class for that. Ma'am, there are police officers on all around the area. We are in the middle of an important activity, and I need you on the boat where you'll be safe. She reluctantly held out a hand, even as she instinctively looked around the marina for other people. Drew wasted no time in grabbing her hand, pulling her onto the boat. He could feel her stiffen in surprise as he hustled her into the wheelhouse. He pulled out his radio. Civilian is on my boat. Copy, came the reply. Drew looked over the marina, waiting. He still had a hand on the woman's arm. He could feel her trembling violently. Distracted, Drew looked over at her. She was pale, had her eyes closed, might be hyperventilating, and looked ready to faint. I think I need to get off the boat. Not an option, grimaced Drew. She wanted on, and now she wanted off? He knew women changed their minds a lot, but this was excessive. Here, sit down. Bethany led him direct her to a seat. Her teeth were chattering, and she put her head between her legs. I think I might throw up. Great. Drew looked around for a container. What was your name? Bethany, she replied. Here. He shoved a grocery bag into her hands. What is your name? asked Bethany. Andrew, he supplied. Most people call me Drew. Nice to meet you, Bethany said from between her knees. Colburn, did they just pass you? Colby asked through the police radio. Drew berated himself for getting distracted by the gorgeous female beside him. He scanned the windows. Targets approaching, count five. What does that mean? Bethany asked worriedly. I've got five bad guys going into our trap. He spared her a glance. What is wrong with you? I do not like boats, she hugged herself. Drew was about to ask her why she would come on to this one then, but he was distracted when he saw one of the men split off from the group. Stay here. What? she asked in consternation. Drew ignored her as he left the boat, unholstering his gun. She was going to die. She was going to expire from not being able to breathe properly, and no one was going to save her because some cop who looked like Max Ramsley, but was handsomer, had just run away from her. Bethany huddled on the floor, her eyes tightly shut. It was safer than sitting in the chair, waiting to take a nosedive if she fainted. She tried not to cry. What if the criminals he was chasing came and found her on the boat? What was she going to do? Her eyes snapped open. She knew she was not going to be able to get from the boat to the dock. Crossing that span of water was as impossible as crossing the Grand Canyon right now. She simply could not do it. Hide. She could hide. Slowly, Bethany looked around. There had to be somewhere she could squeeze herself into that they would not find her. She uncurled herself, crawling, breath coming in gasps as she tried to find a good place to hide. Bethany reached up and opened a door. It was a cabin. She opened another door in the small hall and found a bathroom with a tiny shower in it. She pulled herself into the shower, shutting the curtain. Too late, Bethany realized that she had left her purse behind. Shaking and huddled on the shower floor, she was not going to go back for it. Bethany could not move if her life depended on her, which it very well might. Why, oh why, had she decided to go on a boat this morning? Bethany sobbed, hugging her knees to her chest. She was going to die on this stupid boat. They are going to find her dead in the shower because she left her purse out for any half-intelligent criminal to find. Suddenly, the shower curtain opened and Bethany screamed. Whoa! Drew backed up a pace, putting both hands palm up in the universal sign of surrender. It is just me. He waited for her to calm down, but she just kept shaking, sobbing, and laying on the shower stall floor. Drew crouched down beside her, reaching a cautious hand to rub her back. Hey, you are safe. We can get off the boat. Everything is going to be fine. He kept rubbing her back and saying what he hoped were soothing things to get her to calm down, telling her it was going to be okay. Promise? she asked in a pathetically tiny voice. Promise, Drew assured her. He was surprised when she almost crawled into his lap, wrapping her arms around him. She had said she did not like boats, but this was a little extreme. Why don't we get off the boat? Would you like that? he asked her. Bethany nodded shakily, pressing her face into his chest. Please. When had he dropped into Crazy Town? Drew wondered. And why him? 
She could have stumbled onto any of the other cops that were in hiding in the marina, but she chose him of all people. Drew carefully picked up Bethany and grimaced at the tiny doorway. It was going to be a struggle to get both of them through it at the same time. She was light in his arms, fitting like she belonged there. Whoa, he thought. Put a stop to those thoughts. The last thing Drew needed was a gorgeous, but not quite right in the head, rich lady. She seemed high maintenance on so many levels. First impressions were not good. He hoped she would not turn into one of those stalker types. One of the other officers had encountered one of those and it had taken him five months to shake the woman when she became obsessed with him. Drew had enough on his plate with any weird woman added into the mix. He squeezed through the bathroom door in the tight hallway to the deck of the ship. It took a moment to decide how best to get from the deck of the boat to the dock without falling in the water. Bethany had him in a near headlock, and it was obvious she was in no condition to try to go from boat to dock. She was shaking so badly, Drew could hear her teeth clicking. You really don't like boats. He tried to make a little conversation. Hopefully he could distract her enough to get her back to normal and send her on her way. If he never saw this beautiful but crazy lady ever again, Drew would be okay with that. Drew made the jump a little awkwardly, but neither of them got wet. No, she whispered, I do not like the water either. Then why would you go on a boat? Drew frowned as he carried her along the marina. I needed to find out. Bethany kept her eyes closed and breathed in the scent of him. She did not know why, but Drew made her feel safe. Find out what? he questioned. Bethany sighed. I'm trying to remember something from my childhood. There's a memory, but it keeps slipping away. I want to know what it is. So you go on boats, which you hate, on water, which you hate, all to try to find a memory from your childhood. Yep, Drew thought. She was definitely from Crazy Town. Something like that. Bethany relaxed a little. You must really work out at a gym. Drew had not complained about carrying her around yet. Caught yourself a prize, Colburn? A male voice asked. Pretty big fish. A mermaid? Another amused voice inquired. Where's her tail? Shut up, Drew replied dryly. If Monroe were doing his job, she would not have made it onto my boat. Bethany looked to see a group of five men watching her with varying degrees of speculation. She blushed a little. They were on cement and a little way from the water. You can put me down now. Sure thing. Drew realized she was a little embarrassed from all the attention. Bethany seemed to have recovered from her earlier bout of anxiety. He set her on her feet. Better? Yes, thank you. Bethany gave him a small smile. She felt a little silly standing before all these men. She must seem like such a wimp to them to need to be carried just because she was near the water. Who is she? A younger man questioned. Bethany. Drew looked at her for an answer. Some detective he was. He didn't even know her last name. Searson, she smiled. Pleased to make your acquaintance. A couple of eyebrows shot up. It was obvious they were not used to that turn of phrase. Colby, Jackson, Demon, Miguel, and Tony. Drew introduced them. Ma'am, smiled Colby, confident in his handsomeness. The others nodded to varying degrees. Are you all police officers? Bethany was curious. Yes, ma'am. Miguel gave Drew a significant look that Bethany could not interpret. Miss Searson? You'll need to go down to the station with us for a simple background check and statement. You were here during one of our operations, and we need to clear you. Is that really necessary? frowned Bethany. She looked at her watch. It was two hours until her first class. How long will that take? It is mandatory, Miguel assured her. Perhaps Detective Colburn can assist you with your statement. Drew gave Miguel a significant look in return. He was not pleased with Miguel's suggestion. The last thing he needed was to encourage this lady. Sure thing. Bethany looked at Drew in consternation as she realized something. I left my purse on the boat. She was deathly afraid of boats and water. Drew sighed. I will go get it. Drew privately acknowledged that he was going to get teased by the guys for this. He was already going to take a ribbing from carrying Bethany around like a damsel in distress. His radio buzzed as he walked back towards the boat. Colburn, who was that with you? A civilian. Drew spoke into his radio. Great. Now the boss was fully aware of Bethany Searson. 
Why is she in my crime scene area? demanded Green. But Roe did not keep her out of it, Drew responded tersely. It was not his fault, nor his responsibility, to keep civilians out of the area. It was enough hot water for yesterday's performance. Drew did not need any more issues with his supervisor. Bring her in. Make sure she does not have any ties to this gang and then cut her loose. Yes, sir. Drew hopped onto the boat and looked for Bethany's purse. He found it easily and snooped through it. Her identification matched her name. She is only a couple years younger than him. Bethany had a good quality health insurance plan card. She also had a swipe card for entry into the city auditorium. There was a couple hundred dollars worth of cash in her wallet. Her purse contained the usual assortment of mints, lip gloss, tissues, and any other items women would carry around. Drew found her date planner and had a quick look. Not that he thought he might find today's entry reading Crash Police Sting Operation, but he might see something useful. Bethany had regular appointments with someone named Dr. Urshman. That did not surprise Drew. He knew a crazy lady when he saw one, and he suspected this was the shrink. She also had a class times written down. He wondered what she was studying, practice and performance times, scheduled Sunday dinners with her parents, and the most interesting entry of all simply said, pool. For a woman who was afraid of water and boats, she had gone to the pool. Drew wondered exactly what Bethany Searson's game was. Her cell phone was locked. He did not have the code nor a warrant, so he dumped all of her stuff back in her purse. Gucci. It did not look like a knockoff. It was frayed on the strap, but otherwise in great condition. Bethany's clothes had all looked smart and expensive. Rich and crazy. Drew took the bag and left the boat. It did not take him long to reconnect with the group who gave him no grief about the purse. They were probably all trying to be polite in front of the lady, which each were slightly flirting with except Miguel, who raised an expectant eyebrow when Drew returned. Drew appreciated the fact that he never had to call out Miguel on any inappropriate comments or behavior regarding women considering the man was married to Drew's sister, Jana. Then again, Jana was more than capable of keeping Miguel in line. She kept Drew and his brother Molson in line for years, practically raising them single-handed because their mother was a flake. Miss Searson, if you're ready to go, Drew asked her. It was not really a request. He handed her back the purse. D-Man snickered. Drew gave him a sharp look, but all five guys were trying to look innocent. Great. He wondered what they were up to. Yes, Bethany answered him. It was nice to meet you all. Pleasure, Colby nodded with a wide smile. Drew scowled at him. Drew knew that many women have the habit of falling under Colby's charm. He did not need Bethany to do that. He needed her to fill out a report and be on her way out of his life forever. The rest of the men murmured that it was nice to meet her in return, and Drew gently took Bethany by the elbow, steering her away from the group. They seemed very nice, Bethany tried to smooth over the awkwardness. She was picking up on some odd vibes from Drew. He seemed very abrupt. Bethany had obviously interrupted his day, and he had been somewhat annoyed with her ever since. He might look like Max Ramsley, but he had none of his charm. Why were you on the boat, Bethany? Drew asked as they came to the parking lot. I told you, Bethany replied with a frown. I'm trying to recover a memory. You said you were afraid of water, he stated as he unlocked the truck. Drew had brought the truck so that he could carpool with Miguel and some of the guys to the marina. Now they were going to have to find their own rides back to the station. He held the door open for her. Drew expected a woman like Bethany would never open a door for herself. She was that class of lady. Yes, I'm terrified of water. Bethany gave him an odd look as she got into the vehicle. I have already told you this. He shut the door and got into the driver's seat. Drew looked at her to see her reaction. Then why do you have an appointment in your day planner that says pool? Bethany looked at him in shock. Pools generally have water in them. People who are scared of water tend to stay away from pools. Drew waited for her response. You went through my purse. She was stunned. It was the first time anyone had ever invaded her privacy like that. Yes. Drew started the truck. Care to explain about the pool? Bethany decided to revise her opinion of the man beside her. He was rude and surly. He was not handsome like Max Ramsley at all. 
Just because he rescued her on the boat, carried her, and caused little flutterings in her stomach, did not mean that she was attracted to him in the least. She turned her face away from him to look out the window. Not particularly. He pulled out the parking lot and into traffic, past her taxi, who was still waiting for her. Bethany almost said something, but one look at his face had her changing her mind. He did not look happy at all. Bethany, you need to tell me about the pool. You are involved in an investigation of a local gang. You stumbled onto our sting operation, and I need to confirm that you have nothing to do with the gang. Otherwise, I am going to have to arrest you. Drew gritted his teeth. He did not care for her talking to him in that snooty little tone of hers, not particularly. It made him feel like some scum she had found on the bottom of her shoe. What would she think when she found out he was the illegitimate son of David Ramsley? Drew firmly told his inner voice to go away. First, she might not run in those circles of society, though he doubted it since she knew Max Ramsley. Second, he was just going to get her statement and send her on her way back to Crazy Town. He never had to see her again. He never again had to see her blue eyes look at him in gratitude like he had just saved her entire world and become her hero for carrying her from a stupid boat. Then I should have a lawyer. Bethany knew that much. If he was going to threaten to arrest her, whatever for, she really did not understand. But she knew she should get a lawyer. Maybe she could even get her father to sue and get this arrogant man dismissed from his job. Or you could tell me, and we could both save a lot of time. Drew waited at a red light. I don't think you would like waiting in jail with other people in a cell. She would not. Bethany knew that instinctively. She was half afraid of her own shadow some days. Bethany had no desire to share accommodations with people of criminal activity. She sighed. I had an appointment with Dr. Urshman at a local pool to try to trigger my reclusive memories. Dr. Urshman is your shrink? Drew asked to confirm his earlier suspicions. He had practice at spotting crazy. There was a reason his mother's nickname was Wacko Margo. Psychiatrist, Bethany clarified a little curtly. Whatever, same difference in his mind. Drew laid on the gas and cut down an alleyway to avoid traffic. How did it go? It was frustrating, softly admitted Bethany. I did not learn much. That is why I thought I would come to the marina and try again. What did you learn? Drew kept up with the questions. Bethany sighed. I learned the water had a white film on it. I learned his hand was not on my face. It was in the hair on the back of my head as he pushed my head under the water in the bathtub. Say again? Drew frowned fiercely as he parked the truck in the police lot did not like the imagery of what she had just described. Start from the beginning. I have been having nightmares since I was a child. They have gotten worse lately, explained Bethany. I dream that I am a child. I'm at a marina and where there are lots of boats. I know the area and I feel perfectly safe even though I'm not supposed to be out there by myself. I'm searching for a particular boat, but I always get on the wrong one. I hear voices that I know. There are... Two men on the boat, and I know I will get in trouble if they find me, so I hide from them. Bethany's voice trailed away as she remembered, her face pale, and her hands trembled as she pushed an errant strand of hair out of her face. One of them finds you, Drew surmised from her previous comments. Yes, she swallowed hard. He is drowning me in this ugly little tub. The water has a white film on it. I can hear him telling me that I don't see anything. No, wait, that's wrong. Bethany bit her lip, closed her eyes, and tried to remember. It was teasing her at the edge of her mind. If she could only grab it. If she could only remember. Drew patiently waited. She was struggling with something. He wondered whether he should believe this story about a memory that she was trying to find. Then again, it was not his experience that normal people made up stories about getting drowned in a tub. Of course, he was not particularly certain of Bethany's sanity just yet. It's gone. Bethany sighed in disappointment as she opened her eyes. I cannot remember it properly. Why don't we go inside? Drew said gently. I will take your statement, call your psychiatrist for verification, and you can be on your way. Bethany nodded. Her eyebrows furrowed in a frown as she glanced at him. 
Do regressive memories count for testimony in a court trial? That would depend on a lot of things. The psychiatrist who assisted in exposing these memories would be under a lot of scrutiny since false memories have led to unjust convictions before. Drew watched her, wondering at her angle. Why do you want to know? It was a crime, wasn't it? He almost killed me. There was a tinge of fear in her eyes. There was determination, too. Drew sighed. You said it was a nightmare, a reoccurring dream. Without more to go on, no one can say that it is a memory. Who owns the boat that you were on in your memory? I do not know, Bethany whispered. You say the voices are familiar, but you don't know who they are, he stated. That's right. I feel if I could just figure out who they are, I would know the rest, she said in frustration. There is no motive for trying to drown you, Drew reasoned. Plus, you are obviously alive. Is there anything that can be done? Bethany asked, her eyes pleading with him. I need proof of crime to charge someone. Drew felt sympathy for her. He told himself firmly that that was all he felt. I'm sorry. Bethany slumped in the passenger seat and nodded. She had not really expected him to do anything. How could he when she could not know who was at fault or what really happened all those years ago? She fiddled with her purse strap and tried to ignore the ever-present frustration. Drew came around to her door, opening it for her. Look, if you think of any more details, you can always let me know, Drew offered, much against his better judgment. If it gets to a point where we can start an investigation, I'll be willing to help. Really? Bethany looked at him hopefully. Maybe he was not so bad after all. She put her hand into his and gracefully stepped out of the truck. I really appreciate that. Drew quickly dropped her hand. He was already regretting his impulsive offer to help. He nodded and gestured to the drab police building. Shall we? He escorted Bethany inside. It did not take long to fill in a statement form, have her sign it, and call the shrink to confirm her story. Bethany might be crazy, but according to the psychiatrist, she was telling the truth. Drew called her a taxi and sent Bethany on her way after she reminded him of his offer to help if she remembered any more of the dream that had been plaguing her. Drew agreed because he was a man of his word. Part of him hoped he would see her again. Most of him hoped that was the last of Bethany Searson in his life. Drew did not need that sort of complication. She might be the most gorgeous woman he had ever seen. She might have made him feel ten feet tall, carrying her off that boat like a hero. But she was trouble. He did not fit into her world, and she did not fit into his. Drew watched her leave the police station, then resolutely put her from his mind. When he went to join his boss and the rest of the narcotics team, he was greeted by the sight of them all hovering around Demon's phone. Want to share? Drew asked dryly as the group quickly split up, the guys looking guilty as ever. We already did, Colby grinned unrepentantly. It's all over the station. Drew had a look at the picture on D-Man's phone. It was of him carrying that blasted purse down the marina. I'm not so sure Gucci is really your style, Miguel commented with a snicker. Thanks, Drew said dryly. Maybe if Monroe could do his job, I wouldn't have had a civilian on my part of the operation. Where is Monroe, anyway? He's down for the count, Captain Green entered the room. Food poisoning. Nice purse, Colburn. Drew sighed and slumped into a chair. He was going to endure a lot of teasing during the next week or so until something funnier made the rounds in the police station. If you enjoyed Chapter 4 of Love and Lies, Book 5 of the Ramsley Brothers series, please look out for Chapter 5. Also, please click the like button. This is free for you to do, and it helps me with the algorithms to grow my YouTube channel. Thank you, and happy reading!